Will you two wrap it up already? You have been arguing about Kaida and Alenko for an hour. He's not even interesting enough to warrant this. Let's break even and put him in C tier. This is bullshit. Shut up, Joe. No one else likes your mid-boring, bland human character. C tier is honestly too high for him, but I'll accept that so we can move on. Okay, next on the list we have Ashley Williams. She's another boring human, but she's at least got some personality. Personality, Barack. Have you finally lost your damn mind? The only personality Ashley has is that she hates aliens. Oh, here we go. She doesn't trust Garrus and Rex, two infinitely superior squad mates. She's mean to Liara and spends all of Mass Effect 3 not trusting Shepard F-tier squad mate. Radical leftist Sleepy Joe is calling everything racism. Why am I not surprised? Ashley Williams is a fine example of a human first, America first, wonderful woman. She has every right not to trust those illegal aliens being on the Normandy, a first class human vessel. You don't even know anything about the character you like so much. First, Ashley was born on the colony world Serona, so she can't be America first. Nerd face. Second, the Normandy is a joint creation between the humans and Turians. Third, nerd face. Shut the up. Third, Ashley literally says in Mass Effect 2 that she doesn't like aliens, so there you go. You have all that knowledge, but don't know that Ashley is completely over her minor dislike of aliens in Mass Effect 3. Okay, gentlemen, in the interest of saving time, let's just reach a middle ground on this one. Yes, Ashley has a history of not trusting aliens and perhaps having some off-color comments about them. However, she can ultimately grow past all of that, especially if you romance her as a paragon in Mass Effect 1. Plus, Ashley is at least an accurate representation of how people would normally behave if we met aliens. I think C-tier is a fine place for her. I hate to see a true Make Humanity Great Again soldier rated so low but fine. Ashley can be in C-tier so sleepy Joe doesn't try to cancel Bioware for making an interesting female character in 2007. You only like Ashley because she's the only woman in Mass Effect you could ever pull. Gentlemen, please. Moving on, we have Garrus Vicarian. I think we can all agree he goes straight into S-tier. Now hold up. You are not going to put that lizard bird in S-tier while a great human like Ashley Williams sits next to boring Caden Alenko. Ain't no way. Donald, you are not seriously going to say that Garrus is anything but the perfect squad mate. He's your ride or die throughout all three games in the original trilogy. He's the perfect protege who eventually becomes your second in command. Garrus never talks back to you, will never betray you, and is always on your side. And everything you just said makes him only a little bit more interesting than Caden. Ain't no damn way. Yes, Garrus is the most ride or die squad mate in the trilogy, but that's all he is. It doesn't matter what you do, he will always side with you. He has no complexities whatsoever. He's boring as fuck in Mass Effect 1, a Walmart Punisher in Mass Effect 2, and just Shepard's sidekick in Mass Effect 3. Bro says this about Garrus, but likes Ashley. At least Ashley had the guts to stand her ground in what she believed. Garrus bends to the will of Shepard. You kill Sidonis and he's happy. You let Sidonis live and he's still happy. No change, no development. Just the same old alien bird. Okay, Donald, where would you place Garrus? Barack, just put him in S tier and move on. He'll talk your damn ear off. D tier, because at least Caden will stand up to you on the Citadel in Mass Effect 3. The only exciting thing that character does in the entire trilogy, but it's more than Garrus. Bro has lost it. Donald, we are not putting Shepard's best friend in D tier, but I see where you're coming from. In the interest of remaining bipartisan, I'll settle for putting Garrus in A tier. Dude, for real? That's still too high, but fine. Far be it for me to have opinions that go against the norm. Okay, now that we've passed that hurdle, let's talk about Erdnot Rex. He is another amazing squad mate, probably the best written squad mate in Mass Effect 1, and he has some great moments in Mass Effect 3. I think a solid S tier works here. Finally, a based opinion. Rex is outright the only interesting alien squad mate in the first game. Not only does he have a compelling backstory, but he also has the guts to draw on Shepard when he disagrees with destroying Saren's genophage cure. Have the both of you finally lost your goddamn minds? First of all, this is a squad mate tier list, and Rex isn't a squad mate in Mass Effect 2 or Mass Effect 3. Second, he's no different than Ashley. Rex hates Turians and Salarians. He openly talks about eating Salarian livers on Sir Kesh. Joe, are you seriously trying to compare Ashley's unjustified bigotry with Rex's understandable hatred of the people that sterilized his entire race? The genophage didn't sterilize the Krogan, it just altered fertility rates. How are you a genophage apologist and calling Ashley racist? 
All Ashley wanted was for humanity not to become dependent on the Council. The Salarians and Turians literally committed a war crime against an entire species of aliens. How are you an Ashley fan when she kills your favorite alien squad mate Rex on Vermeer? Joe, that only happens if you don't get Rex's family armor and don't have the guts to shoot him yourself. That's on you. Besides, this is getting off topic. I'm with Donald on this one. Rex has one of, if not the best, character arcs in the entire trilogy. I will also concede that unlike Garrus, he is far more complex because he will put his foot down when you do something he disagrees with, but will still be ultimately loyal to you if you do right by him and his people. Plus, did you see him in the Citadel DLC? The dude moved like a tank. Uncle Erdnot Rex, that's my guy. Sorry, Joe, but we're not budging on this one. Rex is an obvious S-tier squad mate. Fine, but I'll remember that you put Rex in S-tier and left Garrus in A-tier. Yeah, you'll remember it until the dementia kicks in again. Okay, next up we have Tally. Now I don't know about either of you, but I don't really like her that much. I'm feeling a B-tier, maybe even a C-tier. Barack, are you for real? Tally is the most ideal romance in the trilogy, and putting her any lower than S-tier is complete malarkey. Finally, this motherfucker says something I can agree with. Tally Zora Vos Normandy starts out slow, but you see her grow from a kid on her pilgrimage into a full-fledged Quarian Admiral. Her romance is hugely compelling, and just like Rex and Ashley, Tally isn't afraid to stand up to Shepard if you don't do what she asks on her loyalty mission. I just can't see past that Tally only barely exited her adolescence by the time you can romance her in Mass Effect 2. She's basically a little sister. Also, Donald, you admitted that Rex is the only exciting alien in the first game. And you were right. Tally only exists to deliver exposition about the Geth and Quarians. You don't learn anything about her at all until Mass Effect 2. Not to mention her personal mission in the first game was a long and glorified fetch quest. Yeah, her mission in the first game was horrible, just horrible. I always skip it now. Tally might be a bit boring in the first game, but at least she's in all three games, which is more than you can say for every other squad mate besides Garrus. Tally has a great character arc and romance, and the Rannick climax is the highlight of Mass Effect 3 because of your long history with Tally. Okay, I still want to put her in B tier. What about you two? Tally is an S tier character with hips to back it up. Oh, the hips, the beautiful, beautiful hips. Y'all are down horrendous. What if we just break even and put her in A tier with Garrus? Yeah, that's fine, because Tally's mission in Mass Effect 1 drags her down. I cannot f***ing believe the two squad mates that are with you for the longest are in A tier. Being around longer doesn't make them better, Joe. We're moving on. The last squad mate for Mass Effect 1 is Liara. Gentlemen, I'll let you go first. Barack, this is obvious. Liara is the perfect squad mate up and down. She's completely loyal to Shepard, but still manages to develop from a shy, nerdy girl into a badass information broker. My, she's such a blue beauty, too. A big S tier. Huge agree. Liara is the most plot relevant squad mate in the trilogy. You need her in Mass Effect 1 to understand the Prothean visions. She saves your body from the collectors in Mass Effect 2 and becomes the shadow broker so she can help you win the war in Mass Effect 3. Without Liara, the entire story doesn't work. Gentlemen, I'm going to have to object here. Liara is central to the plot of Mass Effect, but that's because BioWare showed her undue favoritism. The character goes through a total 180 in Mass Effect 2, and she's pretty dull in Mass Effect 3 if you aren't romancing her. Her only major character moment was standing up to Havok, and even that was short-lived. Barack, tell me you're not spouting that BioWare forced Liara onto the player crap. Yeah, come on, Barry. Besides, the attention Liara received was well warranted, and her character changes in the second game weren't bad. They needed to make an entire DLC story to recontextualize Liara's development. That might not be a problem now with the Legendary Edition, but back in the day, you would be lost entirely if you didn't have the Shadow Broker mission. That reeks of Bioware not thoroughly planning out Liara's character arc. Barack, your criticism of Liara is that the best DLC mission in the entire trilogy had her as a focus. Do you hear what you're saying? Good point, gentlemen. I'll concede on this one and put Liara in S tier. A great day for a beautiful Asari. Finally, a squad mate with your back through the trilogy gets what they deserve. Okay, next up we have Mass Effect 2 squad mates. Jacob Taylor is the first Mass Effect 2 squad mate to rank. Now I'm sure there won't be much debate on this one, so why don't we all answer simultaneously? F tier. Yep, quick and easy. Just what was Bioware thinking with this character? He's not even good in gameplay either. Pull, incendiary ammo, and barrier? The dude is just a weaker grunt. They took the worst qualities of Caden and the worst qualities of Garrus and mashed them into one character. 
He even cheats on female shepherd. Donald, you're the last person who should be criticizing another man for cheating on their partner. Excuse you? Barry cooked you, Don. Just take the L and move on. Next up, we have the beautiful and perfect Miranda Lawson. Don't tell Michelle I said this, but Miranda is my Mass Effect waifu. She's an easy A tier, maybe S tier. I always knew you were a man of refined taste, Barack. Not only is Ms. Lawson an 11 out of 10, she's another humanity first woman who puts her extraordinary mind to put humanity above those damn aliens. Donald, how can you simp for Liara and Tali and be so anti-alien? I'm but a simple man, Sleepy Joe. I might be pro-human, but even I cannot deny the many benefits that the galaxy has to offer. But I don't expect such a pro-alien goody good like you to understand such complexities. Okay, but seriously, besides being pretty and perfect, what does she have going for her besides that? Sure, she has a little bit of development going from an ice queen to being a lot nicer to Shepard, but it's nothing special. Fellas, hello, did I disconnect again? Okay, look, Joe, the creator of these videos is a Miranda simp and will not let us put her in B tier, even though that's probably where she belongs. What do you mean, Barack? What creator? Oh, sh he doesn't know. Don't mind it, Joe. We're just going to put Miranda in A tier and move on. Uh, all right, then. Moving on to Dr. Morden Solis. I think he's a great and complex character with a character arc right up there with Rex's. I can confidently say he's an S tier character. Damn right, Barack. Morden's growth from always defending his genophage modification to seeing the wrong and it is everything a character like Ashley is missing. Morden makes the ultimate sacrifice to right his wrongs and I'll never forget bawling my eyes out at his death during Priority Tuchanka. And despite being a nerdy Solarian, Morden shows he has got a quad down there when he stands up to Rex and refuses to sabotage the genophage cure. Are we actually all in agreement here? Seems that way. All right, Morden goes into S tier and we move on to Grunt. That's my son. The appeal of Grunt is helping him find a place among his Krogan people and helping him evolve from a killing machine into a principled warrior. I don't think Grunt is enjoyable or complex enough to be in the upper tiers, but I can see him in B. That seems reasonable to me. Grunt is excellent, but he's a more basic character. Don't worry, Grunt. You're Papa Trump's S-tier warrior no matter what those two pie jacks say. Next, we've got the psychotic biotic Jack. She has a man's name, she's bald, and she's built like a twig. Donnie, you fat f***ing orange, you're built like a pumpkin, and you have the same color tone as one. Don't you ever disrespect Jack in front of me again, or I'll shove my collector rifle so far down your gullet that it'll make what Gavin Archer did to his brother David look like a fun afternoon at Silver Sun Strip. Those were a lot of words for you to string together. It sounded like you got tired at the end there, Sleepy Joe. Gentlemen, focus. Jack's selling point is her romance more than anything else. Jack has serious trust issues because almost everyone she's ever been with has used her for her power, except for one guy who was serious about settling down with her, but he gave himself up to save Jack. In the romance, you slowly get Jack to trust and believe in you, and you find that deep inside, she's a real softy who will do anything to protect the people she loves. I thought Miranda was your type. Why do you know so much about Jack's romance? I am a seasoned player, Donald. I've explored all romances at least once, even Jacob's. Gross. Anyway, Jack is an A-tier character. Her romance carries her, but outside of it, most of her development happens off-screen, keeping her out of S-tier. No argument from me. Sure, put the weird girl in A-tier. All right, now we have Thane. Where do we want him, gentlemen? Get that weak sauce frog boy off my screen before I catch that disease he died from. I'm surprised you don't deny the existence of Keppral syndrome, Donnie. Weak sauce? Thane is arguably the best fighter among all the squad mates. Frog boy lost to a dollar store Nightwing that just had a sword. Imagine losing to a weeb. Couldn't be Erdnot Rex. Put that overly sensitive toad in C tier where he belongs. Okay, let's settle down, Don. Thane is a great character, an assassin that decided to spend his final moments doing good in the universe, and his goal to save Kolyat from the darkness of crime is very touching. Also, his romance is something else. It not only elevated Thane's character, but elevated female Shepard as well showing that even the hardened soldier can be an emotional pillar for Thane in his dying moments. Thane isn't even necessary to the story. You don't have to recruit him in Mass Effect 2, and even if you did, he isn't of any use on the suicide mission. Thane exists solely, so the female Mass Effect fan base has some eye candy. What is your issue with Thane? Besides being an assassin, he is probably one of the least offensive characters in the game. Melania keeps going on and on about how she wishes I had a body like Thane. Skill issue, Thane is going in A tier. God damn it. Let's see, next, we have the Asari Justicar Samara. That's Samami to you, good sir. Samara is kind of interesting. 
Her character is set in stone from the moment you meet her, and she doesn't change too much in the good or the bad. The most emotion you see out of her is after you kill Morinth, but that's short-lived. Her romance, if you can even call it that, is also really disappointing. I cannot believe I had to wait through two entire games and a DLC mission to get a hug from this beautiful tall glass of Asari water. Horrible, just horrible. I don't dislike Samara, but I can't say I like her all that much either. I think she belongs in C tier. Yeah, I can't imagine putting her on the same tier as Jack or Grunt. C tier for cock blocking me Bioware. Okay, and if we're doing all of the squad mates, we also have to place Morinth on the list. Wait, Morinth is a squad mate? If you have enough morality, you can choose to kill Samara and have Morinth replace her instead. Why would anyone betray Samami like that? It's not worth it. Morinth is just Samara under a different name. No one besides Kasumi ever figures out what you did, and Morinth only appears as a banshee in Mass Effect 3. Morinth is barely a squad mate. Just put her in F tier with Jacob. Not only is she worthless as a squad mate, but she's also an awful person with zero redeeming qualities. F tier on the basis that getting her requires you to betray Samami. Let's do Legion next. I think this character is fantastic, but they're limited by how little time you spend with them. Why in actual hell did Bioware wait until the end of Mass Effect 2 to give us the Geth squad mate? Legion deserved better. They open us up to a greater understanding of the Geth, our enemies from the first game, and in the third game, we get to watch them sacrifice themselves to give all of their people true sentience. Legion's death is almost as heartbreaking as Morden's, but I feel like we didn't get enough time to know them. Donald, you're being uncharacteristically quiet. It's because he's already made up his mind. Put that piece of scrap metal in F tier. Dude, no way. I'll never forgive the Geth for what they did to the Quarian people, and I'll never forgive the Geth for what they did to the 212 Ashley's unit on Eden Prime. The Geth continuously side with the Reapers throughout the games, and Legion itself is in awe of them and refers to them as godlike. I trust those damn machines even less than I trust aliens. I got a feeling you have a lot in common with Javik. I'm not surprised you like Legion, Sleepy Joe. You owe your fake win in 2020 to robots, but don't worry, I'll have my own Legion of AI to help me in 2024. Are you still hung up on 2020? Gentlemen, this is a Mass Effect discussion. Save that for your own time. The conflict between Geth and Organics is complicated, but that doesn't have anything to do with Legion. As we've said, they had great potential as a character, but didn't get to live up to it because of how late they joined the squad. I think Legion going into B tier is acceptable. Putting a damn robot next to Grunt insanity, you robot lovers will regret this when the Geth are our enemies for the fourth damn time in the next Mass Effect game. DLC squad mates for Mass Effect 2 are next. Let's start with Zaid. The old guy kind of uninteresting. His backstory as a Blue Suns leader is mid, and all he does is just tell boring old man stories like Sleepy Joe. Donald, you're four years younger than me. Wake up to reality, we're both old. D tier is looking a bit lonely, so why don't we put Zaid there? Sounds good, D for DLC. Now we move on to Kasumi. A bit more interesting than Zaid, she has good banter with Shepard. Why, why are we not allowed to romance her? Joe, calm down. I can't tell you how devastated I was when I found out Keiji was her boyfriend. It should have been me in that flashback, not him, it's not fair. Donald, where should we put Kasumi since Joe is crying? Put her in D tier with the old man. Kasumi had the potential to be entertaining, but being DLC limited what Bioware could do with her. All right, we've got three squad mates left from Mass Effect 3. James Vega is first. What do you think about him, gentlemen? He's no Rex or Grunt, but I'll give him points for crashing his shuttle into those Cerberus guys on Mars. James is a much-needed squad mate, considering the dire situation of Mass Effect 3. His comedic nature balances out nicely with Liara's and Garrus's more severe tones. But he's still a guy who wants to take things seriously and do good. D-tier, I can't stand him. His nicknames are lame, his jokes are lame, and the flirting he does with female Shepard is super lame. I'm surprised, Joe. I'd expect James to be someone you resonated with. Jill wishes she was able to romance him, and I can't compete with that. You and Donald are more alike than you realize. Shut the f*** up, Obama. Obama. All right, James is going in C tier. Any objections? Okay, whatever. Let's move on. Let's bring up Javik next. Let me speak my mind on this one. Bioware really tried to sneak this motherfucker in as day one DLC and thought no one would notice. It was unbelievably unbased of Bioware to do this, and it should have been a sign of where the company was going. Javik is a Prothean and extremely relevant to the plot, and they locked him behind DLC. Havik's information was even on the disc. There was no reason for him to be pay-gated. Unsurprisingly, you both lack a genuine appreciation for sound business sense, 
blocking a plot-relevant squad mate behind payment. Genius. I wish I could shake the hand of the higher-ups at BioWare for such a wonderful idea. Donald, you can't be serious about this. Oh, but I am. My only criticism is BioWare locking only Javik behind DLC. Why not other squad mates? Imagine $10 to romance Tally or Garrus, and don't give me that look. I know a bunch of you thirsty-ass alien lovers would cough it up. No wonder all of your businesses fail. Okay, setting aside the bullshittery surrounding Havik, he's a semi-interesting character by being a Prothean. He has decent development from seeing everyone as primitives to respecting everyone for fighting the Reapers. Of all the characters, Havik has the best motivation. The Reapers wiped out his entire species, and now he wants to get it back in blood. He's still kind of one note, though. I agree, and I think I'll keep with tradition and put him in D-tier with the other DLC squad mates. He might be D-tier, but he's an S-tier moneymaker. All right, let's wrap things up here with Edie. I'm sure Donald is a real big fan of Edie, even though she's a robot. You underestimate me, Sleepy Joe. Do you think dressing a damn robot like a real doll will sway me from my beliefs? Well, I've got news for you, my dementia-ridden companion. Humming a humming a humming a humming a bazooing a wooing a woof 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 I think it's fascinating watching Edie actively change her programming to become more human, preferring the lives of the people she cares about over just the self-preservation of the Normandy. And she's essentially the most blameless squad mate in the game. Edie actively chooses to be a good person, even when faced with prejudice for being synthetic. I'm a big fan of hers, not just for her looks, but for her personality, perhaps B-tier or A-tier. Edie should be B-tier. She is outstanding, but she spends all of Mass Effect 2 simply acting as an AI without much personality. The third game is when she shines, but I wouldn't put her in the upper tier based on that. All right, good talk. Barack, Jill, and I are going to watch Paragon Lost this evening. You and the family in? I'm down. It's been a while since Michelle and I have seen it. Donald, we're getting McDonald's to snack on as we watch it if you're in. Oh, let me cop some nuggets. All right, see you then, boys. Peace. Make sure you get plenty of that honey mustard, Sleepy Joe. Always. Okay, gentlemen, the people have let it be known they want us to cover more Mass Effect characters. Well, I never deny the people what they want, Barack. Where's Sleepy Joe at? All right, boys, I'm here to talk more Mass Effect. Okay, first we have Adrian Victus, the Primarch from Mass Effect 3. Extremely based side character, one of the best introduced. Victus got that dog in him, put him in S tier. Adrian is a homie for life. Who is that up next? It's Agent Brooks from the Citadel DLC. That's weird. I thought I took her head and spaced it out the Normandy airlock. Did I forget again? No, my dementia-ridden friend, you did not. We unfortunately never got to make good on our threats to her. Brooks is annoying when she's pretending to be an ally and wouldn't even slide for Clone Shepard. I got no respect for this character. She's worse than Jacob. The only thing I like about this character is getting to shoot her at the end of the DLC. Imagine being so bad that you almost ruin a fan service DLC mission. Okay, next is Eve, also known as Erdnot Bakara. Holy fucking S tier. Jesus, Sleepy Joe woke up for that one. Bakara is a fucking queen. In only a short time, she establishes herself as the one true hope for the Krogan people. More than Grunt and even more than Rex himself. Bakar is the only leader the Krogan needed to show the galaxy and us, the players, that the Krogan people really could be better, that things will be different this time. Bakara shares with us the pain of living with the Genophage, how she went through great pain in Malin's experiments, and then she would do it all again to spark the fire of revolution. She would be S tier, S plus tier if I were making the tier list. Okay, I think Joe has made himself clear. I'll just put Bakara in S tier. Which nerdy Solarian is that up next? It's Paddock Wicks, the replacement for Morden if he dies in Mass Effect 2. I've never been stupid enough to let Morden die. I've seen a cutscene of Wicks thinking about Krogan sex and imagining how they mate. All I needed to hear, D tier it is. Are those the original counselors after Wicks? Throw all three of those motherfuckers and who cares? I kill them in Mass Effect one one half the time and actively antagonize them the other half. Special attention to Sparatus, the Turian counselor, for saying ah yes Reapers in air quotes. Just for that, put the Turian one in worse than Jacob. If I could, I would specifically kill him and leave the other two alive. Kelly Chambers is next. Kelly is goaded. You can enter a relationship with her and still pursue the squad mates. She feeds your fishies for you so they don't die after your missions, too. It's unfortunate that her romance can't go much further than what occurs on the Citadel. 
She gets points for feeding your fish and being a freak in the sheets, A tier. I recognize that redhead. That is Dr. Michelle from Mass Effect 1. She replaces Dr. Chakwas in the third game if she dies. I seem to recall her having a thing for Garrus. I'm just gonna put her in C tier. I don't care about her, but I don't have any reason to dislike her either. Steve! That line from Shepard was so iconic. I don't recognize him. Donald, did you never speak to Cortez in the shuttle bay of the Normandy? I only went down there for weapons, though I remember hearing some recording of one dude telling another dude, I love you and promise me, and a bunch of other crap. You might remember Cortez as the guy who crashes and dies on Earth because you never helped him overcome his depression, Donald. Oh, that loser, I don't care about him. Okay, well, I do, and Cortez is a decent character and decent romance, B tier. Hey, yo, I know the look of that next guy. That would be Ronald Taylor, Jacob's father. Holy hell, this guy's the reason we have Jacob? Not only that, but Ronald Taylor is a genuine piece of human filth not deserving of even an ounce of the air we breathe. I don't know whether it's better to put him in jail, let him unalive himself, or leave him for the hunters to sort out. You know it's bad when Barry gets riled up. This dude is worse than Jacob. Not only is he the one who spawned the worst squad mate in the trilogy, he's a complete monster. Even I'm not gonna speak up for this guy. Okay, next up is Rex's brother, Erdnot Reeve. He replaces Rex if you have him die in Mass Effect 1. He's a jerk. Reeve represents everything wrong with the Krogan people. He's just a brute. I've never seen him outside of when he gets killed by Kalros. Also, I'll never allow Rex to die. Hear me out. Reeve is indeed just the stereotypical Krogan, but having him be alive as the sole leader of the Krogan people opens up an opportunity to sabotage the Genophage cure and have Morden survive through Mass Effect 3. I'm not saying Reeve himself is a good character, but the alternate path he opens up at least makes him worthy of D-tier. Fine, whatever. He's just Rex's replacement, far as I'm concerned. The four Quarian Admirals are next. Let's rapid fire this. Han Garrel? Completely based and justified in wanting to destroy the Geth. A war-hungry maniac who almost kills Shepard and Tally. Why am I not surprised? The Geth sympathizer hates the only smart Quarian Admiral. You know Tally is also an Admiral, right, Donald? She's dumb, too. Tally was initially smart enough to see the threat of synthetics, but she let Paragon, Shepard, and Legion brainwash. Okay, well, I'm putting Geralt in C tier to break even. Next is Darrow Zen. Who cares? I'm in agreement. Now Zalkoris Vas Quip Quip. The only Admiral focused on doing right by the Geth and the Quarian people. Holy sh**, Sleepy Joe. Do you really think making peace with the damn bots is good for the Quarian people? Better than drafting civilians into war. But you wouldn't know anything about that since you draft Dodge during Vietnam. You bitch, you didn't serve in Nam either. I didn't go because I had asthma, you buffoon. They wouldn't draft me. Sometimes I forget how old the both of you are. Anyway, I think Chorus is based and he's going in A tier. I'm surrounded by robot lovers. Last is Shala Ron. I hate wishy-washy politicians. Ron is the worst of the four because she can't even pick a damn side. Let's just put Shala Ron in worse than Jacob for failing to be anything more than a middle ground Mandy. Deal. Next is, wait, who's this Volus? Ah, uh, finally, something know-it-all Obama doesn't remember. That's Pitney for the biotic god from Samara's recruitment mission. Oh, this goes without saying then. God tier. You're goddamn right. Next up, Gabriella Daniels and Kenneth Donnelly, the Normandy engineers from Mass Effect 2 and 3. I love them. Two of the best crew members on the Normandy. I always visit them after every mission. Their little side romance is very enjoyable, too. They were both intelligent enough to join Cerberus when the Alliance wasn't doing a thing and smart enough to leave as soon as Cerberus revealed their true colors, A-tier characters. Good for us all to be on the same page for once. A-tier it is, and next we have... Oh, God, it's the news girl they introduced for no reason. Why didn't they just put Emily Wong on the ship instead? Why did they kill her off on Twitter? Hell, that fake news reporter we punched out would have been better. Put that Barbie doll girl in F-tier. Okay, boys, hear me out. Diana Allers is a war journalist. It's a real role. Her job is to deliver inspiring news to the troops back on Earth to remind them to keep up the good fight. Allers takes a significant risk doing her job. If the Normandy weren't the best ship in the galaxy, she could see herself getting shot down during a report or abducted by Cerberus or the Reapers. Allers even says in an email that she'll ensure you get a hero's funeral. I have respect for her. She's at least D-tier. All right, fine. I never let her on my ship, so I don't know enough to argue with you. Next is Balak, the terrorist from Bring Down the Sky. F tier. All my homies hate Batarians. Looks like that's Liara's mom up next. It is, and for the right-hand man of the first game's main villain, she's not really all that interesting. D tier, I think. Nah, nah, she's at least an E cup, maybe even an F. Jesus Christ, Donald, he said D tier, not D cup, and you're crazy. She's obviously a G cup. I'm just going to put her in D tier and move on to the Rachni Queen. I always save her. She's B tier. She makes good on her promise to stay out of trouble and comes in clutch during the Reaper War. Ain't no way I'm letting you put that overgrown cockroach spider thing in B-tier. Donald, you hate any alien you can't fornicate with. First of all, I could certainly try to fuck that thing. I just don't want to. Second of all, I don't trust it. If you sabotage the genophage cure, the Rachni will immediately move on to Tachanka. 
they'll overrun the galaxy again. I see both sides on this one, and I'll put the Rachni Queen in C tier. Wait, is that ED next? No, but you're close. That's Dr. Eva, the original AI controlling ED's body. Who cares? I sure don't. Anyway, next up is Samantha Trainer, the replacement for Kelly. She's a better Kelly, not gonna lie. Instead of just telling you when you have mail, Samantha comes clutch multiple times throughout Mass Effect 3, and my only complaint is she wasn't around earlier in the trilogy. I tried to romance her once and found myself barking up the wrong tree. Same, it was quite the embarrassment, but Trainer is still easily an S-tier character. Next, we have David Archer. The, the square, square root of 906.01 is 30.1. S-tier it is, how about Gavin Archer? Worse, Worse than, than Jacob. Jacob. Next is Kalisa Aljilani. D tier for decking the f out of her every time I see her. You just hate the media, Donald. F the media. Devil's advocate, she's not a lousy reporter. She's not afraid to ask tough questions to Shepherd of all people voicing humanity's needs. And she offers a few war assets if you don't knock her out in Mass Effect 3. I'll put her in C tier and move on to Major Kirahe, the Salarian who helps you on Vermeer. Hold the line. A rare Salarian W, finally one that is about action over fake science. Kirahi also promises to help you retake Earth regardless of what the Salarian government says. Easy A tier character, and next we have Warlord Okir, Grunt's dad. He gave us Grunt an automatic B tier. Yep, and next up is the man, the myth, the legend himself. Richard, Richard Leroy, Leroy Jenkins. Jenkins. It is a common misconception that Jenkins dies to get drones on Eden Prime. In reality, he ascended to a higher plane of existence. Jenkins' greatness was too much for the galaxy to handle, and he could not remain with us. You speak the good word of Jenkins well, my brother. He was a man far beyond our comprehension. Had he been able to remain with us, none of the awful things that happened in the trilogy would have ever occurred. Jenkins' departure correlates directly with the fall of Bioware. If Jenkins had been around, the ending to Mass Effect 3 wouldn't have happened. Mass Effect Andromeda wouldn't have happened, and Anthem wouldn't have happened. Bioware would be in its renaissance right now, but alas, we were unworthy of Jenkins' greatness. He didn't leave us. We failed him. Let it be known that Jenkins is the one and the only being that stands above all. May he one day return and deliver us all from the hardships we endure. Amen. Amen. Jenkins is the soul beyond God character in the Mass Effect trilogy. Gentlemen, let us take a moment away from the tier list to have a lengthy, silent prayer in the name of Jenkins. Yes, we will return to the tier list in due time, but for now we pray. As the boys and I pray, we encourage you to join us in paying appreciation to Jenkins. Also, drop a like on the video to help the channel out and feel free to subscribe for more content. Our prayer for Jenkins, which lasted for a non-disclosed amount of time, has ended. Praying to Jenkins always makes my dementia ease off a bit. Back to the tier list, boys. One moment, Joe, before we begin, Donald. Huh, what is it, Barack? Do you remember when I asked who that Volus in God tier was and you called them Pitney Four? Yeah, that's who he is? No, you fool, Pitney Four is not the biotic God. Pitney is the one he worked for before ascending to Godhood. The biotic God's mortal name was Niftu Cal. I knew something was off when I didn't recognize him. Oh no, this is not good. Donald, you're at risk of severe divine retribution. Wait, wait, it was a careless mistake. Consider yourself lucky, Donald, since you're a believer in the greatness of Richard Leroy Jenkins, who is a higher god, you're protected from the biotic god's divine might, but let that be a lesson to you. Yes, I understand. I shall never make such a nonsensical, careless mistake again. I'll just move Pitney 4 to who cares, because let's be honest, no one does. And I'll put the proper biotic god himself in god tier where he belongs. Now, finally, back to the tier list, we start with Harbinger, the boss of the Reapers. I don't think I've ever once been afraid of anything Harbinger has said. It's an absolute disgrace. Harbinger has none of the presence that Sovereign did. Bro is too scared to face his head on and has to use the collectors in Mass Effect 2. This weak-ass Reaper couldn't even stop the Normandy from taking off during Priority Earth. It's F tier. And now we have Donovan Hawk, the antagonist of Kasumi's loyalty mission. That smarmy rich dude, it's just the type of guy I hate. You ever hear the term pot calling the kettle black, Donald? How can you compare me to Hawk? As if I'd be into that namby-pamby, overly artistic bullshit. Hawk is S tier, he killed Keiji Okuda. Good Lord Joe, you can't be that down bad for Kasumi. Barack, we spent eight years in the White House together, you know what I'm into. I'm not even gonna acknowledge what you just said, Joe, and put Hawk in who cares. Wait, why is Thane here? That's Farron, the Drell that helped Liara rescue our body. C tier, Farron isn't interesting, but given that he's partly responsible for Shepard's resurrection, we can give him some points. Fair, keeping with Lair of the Shadow Broker, we have the man himself. Now there's a character that makes a good appearance. The broker is menacing and has a lot of gravitas, and he's a great final boss to the best DLC mission in the trilogy. The boss fight is pretty sick, not gonna lie. Let's put the broker in A tier, and now we have Sovereign. This guy set the entire tone for Mass Effect 1, and his words to you resonate all the way to the end. 
Sovereign should have been the leader of the Reapers, not Harbinger. Speaking to Sovereign on Vermeer is easily top 10 most iconic moments in the entire trilogy. It's when you know that this story is finally getting serious. And Sovereign had that dog in it. When it finds out you're on Vermeer, it pulls a complete 180 to come smoke on that shepherd pack. Then on the Citadel, it says, fine, I'll do it myself. And fight Shepard using Saren's body. Easily the best antagonist in the series, Sovereign is S-tier. Old Commander Bailey is up next. I'm a big fan of Bailey. He's always willing to bend the rules to help Shepard out through their journey. He's definitely memorable. I'd put him in B-tier. Agreed. And next up, we have Gianna Parasini from Novaria Internal Affairs. She gives you a smooch if you help her on Ilium. She's at least B-tier. Why is the Thorian on this list? It's just a giant plant. It also introduces one of the worst sections of the first Mass Effect game, where you shoot at Thorian creepers for 15 minutes. That Plants vs. Zombies knockoff gets F-tier just for that alone. Next up is Admiral Stephen Hackett. Bro looks like he's almost as old as Joey. Surprisingly, Hackett is only 49 years old at the start of the trilogy. Jesus, he aged like milk. He's got some city miles on him, but Hackett is the OG, the GOAT. The only one allowed to speak down to Shepard, but at the same time, always covers for us on our jobs. S-tier. Glyph, Liara's information drone is up next. Stupid machine. Does anyone besides maybe Liara even care? I won't argue, but how do we feel about Henry Lawson? A man who was willing to do what it took to further humanity's advancement. Donald Henry was turning refugees into Huss on Horizon. And he and the elusive man were right and learned how to control Reapers. Also, all his research paid off with Miranda. She's genetically flawless, has great biotics, and will live longer than most people. Great biotics, my ass. Miranda can't even keep the biotic bubble up during the suicide mission. Jack would have no difter. Anyway, Henry Lawson is trash. And the only reason I'm not putting him in worse than Jacob is that he's not around long enough for me to hate F-tier. Why is there a picture of TV static on the tier list? It's supposed to be Shepard's clone from the Citadel DLC. The clone isn't as bad as Brooks, but it's still pretty bad. I actually feel bad for the clone, if I'm being honest. Of course you do. It was brought into life just to be used as spare parts, and then it was tossed aside to do nothing. I won't be too harsh on clone Shepard, but no one steals my ship. The clone is D-tier. Oh no, why is Conrad Werner on this list? Did you know he legit wrote a dissertation on dark energy, bro has a PhD? Are you telling me his full name is Dr. Conrad Werner? Yep, as surprising as it is, that checks out. Well, sh color me surprised, put him in God tier. Done, now we have Emily Wong. The best of the reporters you meet throughout the games, it's a crying shame that Bioware killed off such a beloved side character in a fucking tweet. She's just another fake news media reporter. Donald, you can't call all media outside of truth social fake news, but that aside, Emily is a great but underutilized character, B-tier. Nyrene Kandros from the Omega DLC is up next. Arya's old fling, man, she's just a goody two-shoes Turian who dies in a pretty lame way. I'm actually going to agree with Don on this one. Nyrene is preachy, even to me. Anywhere else in the galaxy, that would be fine. But this is Omega we're talking about. I'm actually quite fond of Nyrene, but I'm outvoted here. How's C-tier work? Better than she deserves, but fine. Next is Athita, Liara's father. She is a pretty funny character, enjoyable to talk to like all bartenders. She has an interesting background as the daughter of a Krogan and a Sari pair right after the rebellion. Put her in B-tier Barak. Looks like Lieutenant Bastard Kai Ling is up next. Man, if you don't get that Reddit debate lord looking Discord mod sounding Sasuke Uchiha head ass boy off my screen. For once the old man is actually spitting, Kai Ling shows up in Mass Effect 3 and immediately starts stinking up the place. Bioware should have kept his ass in the comics, but he's trash there, too. Let me go over all of Kai Ling's L's across the Mass Effect continuity. In the comics, he loses to Jack, twice, and gets his kneecaps blown out by Anderson. Lang lets a terminally ill Drell keep him from assassinating the Salarian Counselor, and then he runs away from Shepard. He fails to kill Miranda when she has proper intel and loses to Shepard's team on the Cerberus base. The only W if you can call it one that Kai Lang has is Thessia, but Bioware manufactured that. Barry, you gotta put him in worse than Jacob. I don't even wanna think about him anymore. It's done, and now Vito Santiago is next. Who, who cares? cares? The only person who cares about Vito is Zaid, and it's just because he wants to kill him. The next character is Thane's son, Kolyat, a really good character who you feel bad for. I wish we could have had more connection with Kolyat. He's a good kid, I'll put him in B tier. Ooh, another Asari beauty is up next. It's Televasir, the specter you face in Lair of the Shadow Broker. Vasir shows us the dark side of being a specter, really doing whatever it takes to get the job done, even if it means working for the broker. She has a decent boss fight, too. I'll put her in A tier. The next character is Oleg Petrovsky, the antagonist from the Omega DLC. Actually a good antagonist. He easily played Arya and took Omega from her. 
And if not for Shepard, he never would have lost it. Petrovsky is also a villain with standards, staying true to his word so long as you don't cause him trouble. He might be the best thing about the Omega DLC. I'm with you on that. He goes in B tier. What about Chief Engineer Adams, fellas? A horrible crewmate. He got the offer to join us in Mass Effect 2 and sat it out. In his defense, he would have gone to jail like Donnelly and Daniels had he joined us. Excuses. That aside, Adams isn't particularly interesting, but I don't hate him. He goes in C tier then. Now we have Karen Chakwas, Doctor of the Normandy. Now there's a character who knows who to follow, and you can always count on the good doctor to have your back. Donald, I thought you hated blindly loyal characters. I hate Garrus because he's a Turian and boring as fuck, not because he's loyal. You're gonna make a lot of people angry if you keep bad-mouthing Garrus and Thane, Don. Chakwas is still a likable character. She doesn't really do much, but it's always nice to have her around. Sounds like an A-tier to me. I spot a filthy traitor coming up next. That would be Sidonis, the man who betrayed Garrus and got his entire squad on Omega killed. It's easy to call out someone else for being a traitor, Donald, but all three of us know you'd be the one to sell the two of us out if you were caught in Sidonis' situation. No doubt about it. I look out for myself first and foremost. Anyway, Sidonis' guilt for betraying Garrus is very compelling and well-written for a character who is only around for a few minutes. I'm sure many people don't experience it since it's easier just to give Garrus the revenge he wants. But Sidonis is a decent character to me. Put him in C tier. I'm gonna have to disagree with you here, Joe. Trust is a very important factor, and betraying Garrus is one hell of a crime, but I don't mind putting Sidonis in D tier. That's a fair take. Why is there a big stupid jellyfish on this tier list? That's Blasto, the first Hanar Spectre Donald. And I won't have you disrespecting him in my presence. He's God tier. Quick and efficient placing, just how I like it. Next up is Saren, a top tier antagonist who stands as a great parallel to Shepard. Bioware nailed it with Saren. He's imposing. But once you learn that he's moving against his will, you begin to sympathize with him because Saren honestly believed his actions would mitigate the destruction the Reapers would cause. Even I'll admit Saren is a welcomed antagonist, S-tier for sure. The Quarian soldier Cal Rigar is next. An underutilized but still amazing side character, Cal Rigar is up there with Victus for badassery. It's a shame he didn't make an appearance in Mass Effect 3, but his reported sacrifice to help the Turians brought a tear to my eye. Rest in peace, Rigar, my brother. When I shot the Reaper on Rannick, I did it for you. Okay, and now we have Navigator Presley, XO of the original Normandy during Mass Effect 1. Who in the hell is this bald guy? Presley is an odd crewmate. He is, at least officially, Shepard's second in command during the first game. But he has next to no dialogue past the beginning of the game. We don't get to interact with him at all. But when he dies in Mass Effect 2, it's like, oh damn, he really is gone. Usually, a character like Presley would go in Who Cares? But he earns some points when you read his journal while searching the Normandy SR-1. In the beginning, Presley outright calls the Normandy a zoo because Shepard lets the alien squad mates come aboard. But after some time, Presley warms up to the aliens, admits he was wrong about them, and says they're comrades that he trusts with his own life. It's a shame we didn't see Presley's evolution, but I can't deny a person who grows past their bigotry and admits their wrong way of thinking, Presley is B-tier. Erdnot Dag is next. He's Grunt's replacement. If he dies in Mass Effect 2, he is basically a Shepard fanboy. I've seen cutscenes of this guy. He's all right, but he isn't Grunt. Sounding like a C-tier placement to me. Miranda's sister, Oriana, is next. Who cares? She doesn't even look like Miranda. Now we have, oh God. It's the goddamn Star Child. The single worst thing to happen to this trilogy. Why? Why, in the name of Jenkins, did Bioware decide to make Shepard hyper-focus on this random kid that died on Earth? And why did the Catalyst take the shape of this kid when there are numerous other dead characters they could have picked from? Just seeing that thing makes me dread finishing Mass Effect 3. Worse than Jacob and probably the worst character overall. Is that Legion? Kind of, it's the Geth VI that replaces Legion if they die or if you turn them into Cerberus. I assume you've experienced it? It's just an AI with none of Legion's uniqueness or subtle development. It is not Legion and it makes that very clear. D tier, we're getting into some heavy hitters here. The Elusive Man is up next. The Elusive Man is a poor man, Saren. His motivations are all over the place from Mass Effect 2 to Mass Effect 3. And I don't feel the least bit sorry about his death. He didn't earn it. The Elusive Man's story is more apparent if you've read the comics, but that doesn't excuse the games for not making it more explicit that he's been indoctrinated the entire time. The Elusive Man is still a human first leader focused on doing the right thing and putting us above the aliens. Sure, he made a mistake and got indoctrinated, but he's still a hero. Donald, we're not going to let you get away with this one. The Elusive Man is a good opponent for Shepard, but as far as being an antagonist goes, he fails to impress. B-tier. 
I guarantee the people aren't going to agree with this. Why is there a random marauder on this tier list? That's no random marauder, Joe. That's the Marauder Shields, the final boss of Mass Effect 3, nay, the final boss of the entire trilogy. I know age has affected your mental capacities, Joe, but how could you forget such a legendary opponent? Marauder Shield stands in your way of the Citadel Beam on Earth, and you must engage it in an epic battle. And if you fail, the war is over. Ah, yes, I recall. Harbinger's final guard to stop Shepard. A legendary character and a legendary battle. Marauder Shields is God tier. They stand as an example of how to create an intense final boss. Oh God, Udina is next. You know, for a moment I kind of sympathized with Udina. And then he tried to kill the entire council during the war. Udina was justified. Ain't, Ain't no, no way, way you, you just, just said, said that. that. Udina was doing what it took to get Earth help. The council wanted to play around and make Shepard play diplomat during a galactic extinction event. If I could, I would have helped Udina. Donald Udina betrays us in Mass Effect 1. How can you side with him? He also denies your Spectre status in Mass Effect 2 if you pick him as counselor and kill the OG council. But I will admit, I don't envy Udina's position in Mass Effect 3. He is one of the most powerful humans in history at the time and can't do anything. I'll put him in C tier. Now we have Arya, the leader of Omega. Ooh, baby, she's in S tier. She's kind of bland, if I'm being honest. Who cares how bland she is, Arya is hot. Donald, I need you to get some post-nut clarity before we do these tier lists from now on. Arya is a good character who can change depending on your actions during the Omega DLC. She's not that good, but I'll still put her in A tier. The GOAT Admiral David Anderson is next. Another character with authority over Shepard, but always has our back. His final talk with us on the Citadel was a tearjerker. Of all the deaths, his was the saddest. Dude finally got to sit down and he just went to sleep for good. Anderson fought the good fight for us in Mass Effect 3, an easy S tier. And now we have the best pilot in the whole galaxy, Jeff Joker Moreau. For a kid with glass bones, I have to give Joker credit. He not only helms the finest ship in human history, but he also manages to pull Edie, undeniable, godlike levels of Riz. At last we reach the end, the only character awaiting us is Shepard themselves. Gentlemen, what do you have to say? Shepard can be many things, renegade or paragon, a man or a woman, a colonist or an earthling. There is one thing about Shepard that is certain, though. They're the one person in the whole galaxy that will always get the job done. Shepard is a character that earns the respect and trust of their allies and the fear of their enemies. Shepard means something different to many people. The only correct place to put them is in their own Shepard tier, a worthy location for one of the most iconic player characters in gaming history. All right, that was a long one, and I'm tired. What else is new, Sleepy Joe? But this was a solid tier list. Thanks, Obama. You know it. Catch you boys later. I'm going to jail. In the Mass Effect community, the only thing that might be more controversial than the trilogy's ending is Mass Effect Andromeda, a game many would say put the series on life support after its tragic release in 2017. However, Andromeda's squad mates and other characters had potential. And if the series had continued, we might have grown to like them. The boys and I believed it best to separate the Andromeda characters from the trilogy cast. It would be unfair to rank the Andromeda crew alongside characters that had the benefit of being in multiple games with years' worth of character development. All right, enough with the disclaimer. Start ranking these mid-characters already so I can go back to my 45th playthrough of the trilogy. First up, we have Liam Costa, who seems to fill the same role as trilogy characters like Caden, Jacob, and James. This might shock you, and it surprised me, but Liam is a decent character. He gave up his good life in the Milky Way because he believed in the Andromeda Initiative and wanted to contribute to a new beginning. He's more appealing than a guy like Jacob. Costa is open with the player, expressing his desire to bridge the gap between the Initiative and the Angara. They didn't come to a new galaxy to feel like outsiders, and Liam tries to keep that from happening. Liam wears his heart on his sleeve, which gets him into trouble during the game. But everything Liam does has good intent, even if it goes wrong. His attempts to learn more about Jal so they could talk without accidentally offending each other is to be applauded, especially considering that the first contact war was technically only a few decades ago to the Andromeda crew. Aliens are still new to humanity here. Liam is too heavy-handed with his morals and is way too judgmental, always trying to put his beliefs onto other characters. While he may mean well, he makes many dumb decisions, like giving crucial Nexus information to the Angara. It may have been a peacemaker idea, but our relationship with the Angara is still new, and we have no idea how long we'll be able to trust them. I will, however, give Liam some credit. He at least has a more pronounced personality than Caden and Jacob. Liam is the quintessential 
mid character in Andromeda. He isn't the worst, but he's far from the best. So we'll put him in C tier. Next up, we have Cora Harper, technically your second in command on the Tempest. She was initially meant to become the Pathfinder, but Alec Ryder chooses you instead. This has her, understandably, upset with you for a while, but she gets over it and accepts Ryder as the human Pathfinder. I don't dislike Cora, but she has a let me speak to your manager looking haircut. Donald, come on, bro. You don't need to cook her like that. Cora has an exciting background. She's a human, but was sent to become an Asari huntress because her biotics were too uncontrollable. Cora's power caused her to feel rejected by people. Her parents sent her to the Alliance. The Alliance sent her to the Asari. And her teacher, Nasira sent her to Andromeda. I don't like that Cora's background with the Asari defines her entire personality, though. What little we learn about her personally, like her interest in starting a rose garden, is immediately overshadowed by her going on about the Asari. She talks more about them than PB does, you know, the actual Asari on your squad. With that in mind, I think Cora also goes in C tier. She's not bad, but I grow weary of hearing her talk about the Asari in every conversation. I don't know about you, but I'll never tire of hearing about the beautiful blue beauty. Next up is Arturian squad mate, Vetra Nix, a former smuggler on Omega. Unsurprisingly, female Turians are just boring lizard birds too. Don't you start, Donald. Vetra is a tall drink of Turian water. She's stated to be six foot six. Signed the girl to the WNBA already. Despite her background in crime and as a mercenary, Vetra is the Tempest's most polite and helpful squad mate. She does come off a bit dry at times, though. I keep telling you guys Turians are boring, but you won't listen. Don't get the wrong idea, Donald. I like Vetra. First of all, she's very inoffensive and has some hidden depths about her. Secondly, Vetra's romance is surprisingly touching. Her lack of confidence when you pursue her is compelling, and seeing her try to cook steak for Ryder was a highlight of my first playthrough. She is a hopeless romantic trying to put in the effort. Reminds me of how much of a nervous wreck Garrus is in Mass Effect 2. Her willingness to cook for you is praiseworthy, but there's no way we're ranking her highly after she burnt that steak. Fair, I'll put Vetra in B tier. Time to talk about PB, an Asari with an intense interest in old technology and poor social skills. Hmm, that sure seems familiar. I know how that sounds, but PB and Liara are far from the same character. For starters, PB is extroverted and bubbly and is interested in remnant tech rather than its culture and society. I like peanut butter and jelly. She doesn't bore you with her old life in the Milky Way. And she's the only one putting the initiative in Andromeda Initiative by looking into it remnant technology to see how it works. PB is a trained gunslinger when you meet her, while Liara is helpless in the first game. PB's romance starts out as a one-off fling with no strings attached which kind of plays into the rumors of a sorry promiscuity. However, PB will eventually come seeking a more committal relationship. It's a very natural progression for a romance compared to what we used to get in the trilogy. Andromeda has its problems, but Bioware stepped it up when it came to writing romances. It is pretty cute that PB isn't brave enough to confess to Ryder's face and uses her pet robot to do it for her. Despite being obsessed with remnant tech, I also like that PB isn't willing to risk other people's lives over it. Despite being on bad terms with her ex, Kalinda, PB still wanted to save her instead of securing the piece of new technology. Her resolution to finally become a true member of the Tempest crew was also a great moment. I consider PB to be A-tier. I agree with you, Joe. All blue beauties should go in S-tier, but A-tier is acceptable. Big boy coming to town, it's knock more Drac. Now you have my attention. Even in Mass Effect Andromeda, Bioware scored another common W with Krogan squad mates. When you meet Drac on EOS, he's doing what any Krogan would do in a new galaxy, beating the hell out of the opposition. Drac wastes no time taking out Ket bases and wiping out their ground troops. The dude is arguably more badass than Rex himself. Drac is over 1,400 years old. No doubt he's seen way more combat than Rex. And with that age comes knowledge and understanding. Drac isn't caught up on the genophage like other Krogan, and can empathize with the other crewmates. He assures Vetra that things will be okay when she doubts the mission, and he tells Vorn to raise his great grandkids with love rather than violence. Drac's relationship with Kesh is one of the best things about the character interactions. Drac is a very forward-thinking Krogan, knowing what it will take for his people to survive in Andromeda. He's angry with Vorn for trying to take a bullet for him during the loyalty mission because a Krogan botanist will be more important than just another one that can use a gun in the long run. Drac is far from the stereotypical Krogans we see in the Milky Way. However, this causes him to devalue his own life and worth to the Krogan people in Andromeda. Drac is a profoundly complex character in Andromeda that can be compared to the best in the trilogy. I believe Drac should go in S tier. 
Drac is without a doubt the best squad mate in Andromeda in my eyes. His writing is the most compelling. Now we have Jal, the only native to the Andromeda galaxy that joins our squad. Jal is understandably suspicious and distant from Ryder and the rest of the crew. He has no reason to trust a bunch of visitors from an entirely different galaxy. I remember his first conversation being very awkward. Jal is distant because he's unsure if he'll have to attack the Milky Way aliens should they turn out to be like the Ket. But once you help the Angara on Vold and rescue the Moshe, he starts to defrost a bit and becomes a lot more friendly with Ryder and everyone else on the Tempest. Jal goes out of his way to start finding gifts for all of the crew and believes that serving with Ryder gives him a true purpose in life. I have to give my respect to Jal, despite being the most alien alien we've ever seen. He shares a fellow, how do I say, appreciation for the beauties of the Milky Way, recognizing the attractiveness of Asari and humans. I'm also a big fan of meeting Jal's entire family after the incident with Aksul. We never get more into the personal lives of our squad in the trilogy, so this makes it feel like you're genuinely a companion of Jal's. He's an excellent squaddy who could have developed into a beloved one if Andromeda got a sequel. Put him in S tier with Drac. Good deal. Now we'll move on to the four crew members of the Tempest, starting with Callow, our new pilot. An extremely common Solarian L shows himself just another amphibian nerd. He's a decent guy, Donald. Callow is the only member of the crew that built the Tempest remaining. All his comrades are long dead. This is why he gets so heated when Gil goes about changing parts of the ship to Callow. His friends are still here working on the ship, and he doesn't want anything messing with that legacy. Callow and Gil will eventually reach an understanding and bond over the beauty of the Tempest. One thing I'll say about Callow compared to Joker is that Callow's emotional investment in the Tempest makes much more sense. Joker risking his life to die with the Normandy and Mass Effect 2 never really made sense and was a way to force Shepard's death. However, with Callow, the Tempest is the work of his long dead friends, the last thing he has of them. His connection to the Tempest is more understandable than Joker's to the Normandy. For just a random crewmate, the Solarian has some decent scenes, but he isn't that great. I can't imagine him higher than C tier. I agree, and now we have Gil Brody, the engineer of the Tempest. What kind of a last name is Brody? It sounds like some slang. You, what's up, my Brody? Don't ever say that again. When someone first mentioned the name Gil to me, I ran around the Tempest wondering who in the hell Gil was supposed to be. Andromeda does a lousy job introducing him to you compared to Suvi and Callow. Gil is kind of basic, if I'm being honest. His romance is nice, but it isn't anything special. He's also pretty dull to speak to most of the time. Gil's one interesting plot point is tackling how the Andromeda Initiative is meant to repopulate since there are only several thousand of each species in the new galaxy. I will say it's pretty intriguing that Ryder and Gil plan to become fathers, which is the only time we see the player character taking the next step with their romance option. C tier seems a fitting place for Gil. He isn't going to be special for most players, but male writers pursuing a same-sex romance will like him. Suvi Anwar is next. She essentially fulfills the same role as Kelly and Samantha from the trilogy, letting you know when members of the squad want to talk. Oh my God, that voice, that accent, it's beautiful. Don't get too excited there, Joe. You and Suvi might be Irish, but you're not her type, if you catch my meaning. I'll just play as female writer and romance her that way. Suvi has a unique outlook on the universe. Coming from a background in science, thanks to her parents and being a woman of faith, and believing that searching for the truth using science doesn't have to diminish one's religion. It was Suvi's work as a scientist that strengthened her beliefs. Suvi tackles some interesting concepts like the morality of creating life and the blend of science versus belief. With her enjoyable romance, I think she's worthy of being a B-tier character. I do agree that Suvi is probably the most interesting human on the Tempest. B-tier it is, and to finish off the Tempest crew, we have Dr. Lexi Tupero, the Doctor of the Tempest. She was born on Omega, probably one of the few good things to come out of that space station. Oh, ho, ho, hello, nurse. I need a checkup at my earliest convenience, which is right now. Lexi is very much like Dr. Chakwas. She doesn't have a romance and doesn't have as much dialogue as the other Tempest crewmates. Just like most doctors, Lexi is very blunt and almost to a fault. She has an interest in studying the Ket, and finds the process of exaltation to be fascinating. She also has a few hidden depths. Lexi turns to alcohol to cope with the fact that members of the crew, like PB, don't believe she cares about them. However, it's clear she does after Ryder temporarily dies to escape the Ket containment field. Despite her lack of a romance and minimal dialogue, I think Lexi can still go into C tier. The less attractive version of Edie is next. Sam is only less attractive because it has a male voice and doesn't have a body. Due to being shackled, Sam is closer to Edie in Mass Effect 2. 
It isn't a truly free AI. That doesn't mean I have to trust it. Unlike the Geth, Sam is integrated into the Pathfinder's mind and body, preventing it from turning against organics. Sam is linked to all of Ryder's senses, allowing it to understand things from an organic point of view. Turning against Ryder or humanity in general would screw it over as well. I'll give this robot a pass since it's nothing more than software, but I've got my eye on it. There is some subtle development for Sam towards the end of the game, believing in concepts like luck rather than statistics. And it does genuinely care for the Ryder siblings, perhaps because it's linked to them. It would have been interesting to see where Sam went going forward, to see if he would take a path like Legion or more like Edie. But unfortunately, Andromeda won't get that far, so we'll have to put Sam in D tier. There are still other notable characters to go over, starting with the N7 operative, Alec Ryder, the sibling's father. You could arguably write an entire story about Alec. His goal of designing a full-fledged AI to save his wife from her terminal illness is a compelling origin story. And giving up his life to save the chosen Ryder sibling was an honorable sacrifice. The man put his family first, no matter the cost. Unfortunately, Alec's work on AI ruined the future of both his kids which is what caused them to join the Andromeda Initiative in the first place. They needed to get away from all the heat in the Milky Way. And while I disapprove of Alex's support of transhumanism, I give him points for being a genuine warrior deserving of the same title as Shepard. He solos an entire Ket squad all by himself on Habitat 7. We hardly knew Alec, but his backstory and motivations are some of the best written in the franchise. For that, we'll put him in B tier. Oh, great. Now we have Jeroen Tan, the director of the Andromeda Project. We're not going to defend this guy, right? Nope, we don't like him, which is fitting because just about everyone in the game hates the guy, too. This little worm is way too self-important for a guy who fell into leadership just because the seven other people ahead of him all died. Tan was an accountant for crying out loud. Who even led him into the chain of succession? Tan repeats the mistakes of the Solarians in the Milky Way by going back on the deal to give the Krogans more political influence after they help quell the Nexus uprising. Causing the Krogan, a vital military asset to the initiative, to become outcasts. The only one who remains is Kesh. Tan also holds ill thoughts about the Krogan, only seeing them as brutes and believing that giving them any power would ruin everything. This is despite the fact that the Krogan brought to Andromeda were chosen explicitly from clans that didn't participate in the rebellions. This is why younger ones like Kesh and Vorn are atypical to the Krogan we usually meet. Tan has a few moments where he's genuinely cooperative with Ryder and does apologize for treating you like you're unworthy. But we're going to put Tan in F tier. Too many characters in the game dislike this guy, Addison, Kesh, Drac, Sloan, and so on. Too many red flags. Now we have Foster Addison, Director of Colonial Affairs for the Andromeda Initiative. She certainly makes an interesting impression when you first meet her. If by interesting you mean she's annoying as all hell, then yeah, sure, she's interesting. In Addison's defense, she's in charge of handling colonial affairs. And due to the Andromeda Initiative's early struggles, she has no colonies to oversee, which is no doubt stressful. Plus, Addison starts respecting you as Pathfinder when you settle EOS, which I think is fair. She isn't as annoying as Tan or as corrupt as Spender, but she's still both those things, so I say we put her in D tier. It would have been nice to see what kind of character she'd grow into. Speaking of Spender, he's next. Easily one of the worst characters. He's directly responsible for the Krogan leaving the Nexus after the uprising. He isn't fond of Solarians either. He also tries to reroute power from the stasis pods with people in them. The first thing we see Spender do is harass a Solarian for installing equipment that's supposed to ensure people can breathe on the Nexus. Unlike Addison and Tan, there are zero redeeming qualities about this guy. He deserves everything he gets and then some. He's F minus tier, the lowest of the low. Agreed. Now we have Terran Condros, cousin of our old friend Nyreen from the Omega DLC. I like him. He reminds me of Commander Bailey. Tehran is always reasonable, always allowing Ryder access to security footage in order to solve mysteries. I dig his background too. Terran's sister and Nyreen didn't become soldiers, like you'd expect from a Turian military family, leaving Tehran to be the good one. He joins the initiative to form his own little rebellion against his family's expectations. For a Turian, Terran isn't that bad. He's not a goody good like his cousin, and he's not afraid to march out protesters at gunpoint. At the same time, when Tan has him arrest Carrie for reporting the uncensored truth, Tehran will temporarily put her in a cell instead of exiling her. He's really good for an NPC, definitely worthy of C-tier. Superintendent Nakmore Kesh, the granddaughter of Drac, is up next. You know, and let me cook here. Female Krogan, not too bad. Ayo, what? You think Vetra is unattractive, but you're into Kesh? 
Vetra is built like a branch, but Krogan, female Krogan, you know they got it going on underneath that armor. I see you didn't take my advice from the last tier list, Donald. Anywho, Kesh might be a desk working Krogan, but she's still a badass, taking no BS from annoyances like Spender and Tan, and she's just as reasonable as Terran. We get to learn a lot about Kesh. She likes sweet things, has a fondness for taking machinery apart, and despite scoffing at the waste of resources, she wants the flowers born grew for her. Kesh, just like Drac, isn't caught up on the genophage either. She doesn't like it, but sees that the Krogan forced the Turians and Solarians into that solution to the rebellion. And her giving birth to a clutch of baby Krogan with no losses to the genophage is a top moment. They even make Ryder one of the godparents, and we're making Kesh A tier. This is a common theme here, but with more games, I believe Kesh could have become a fan favorite NPC. All right, onward to the next Asari. That's Carrie Tavessa, an Asari journalist that is creating a documentary on the Andromeda Initiative. Now there's my type of reporter. I'm surprised, Donald. You're not gonna call her fake news? No, you see, Carrie is perfectly fine with serving as Ryder's mistress, your secret lover. You can be with her and still pursue a squad mate without them being none the wiser. I can bag both Carrie and PB at the same time. Let's go. You really don't see the issue with that, Donald. You're surprised, Barack? No, actually, I'm not. Anyway, Carrie is a decent reporter who will report the truth even if it means Tan will have her arrested. She will also unfortunately be attacked by angry colonists if you give her sugar-coated accounts about the severity of the situation. Though as Mass Effect players, we hardly have any room to criticize the NPCs for attacking reporters. Despite all that, she won't give up reporting and will finish her documentary. Her romance is somewhat uneventful though, so see tier. Now we have Captain Nozomi Dunn, leader of the Human Ark ship. I wasn't sure about her for the longest time, but she has a great moment at the end of the game when she chooses to go down with the ship. Did anyone else start howling laughing when she talked about how it's been an honor to serve with everyone and gets cut off and goes flying out of her chair? Apparently a ship capable of keeping 10,000 humans alive for a 600 year journey between two galaxies didn't come equipped with seatbelts. Anyway, she's no Anderson, but Dunn is pretty inoffensive. She chooses to prioritize the Hyperion crew over herself and is a reasonable authority figure. She's at least a C-tier character. Let's discuss some of the Angara we meet now. Moshe Sheffa, Jal's mentor, is first. She's pretty hard, even if she's mostly a scientist. She even shows up for the final battle. It makes sense. She did train Jal and Axel. I like the Moshe. She's easy on the eyes, and she's well-liked by her people. Put her in B-tier. Next up is Evfra, the leader of the Angaran Resistance. He has a decent backstory. He formed the Resistance because the Ket killed his family, and he suffers a lot because the Rokar recruited his final mother, who wound up shooting at him. No wonder the guy is so cynical and grim. I almost feel like Ephra could have been a good squad mate. His background had potential. I like that he's not willing to bend to the wishes of Ryder unless you give him ample reason to trust you. Good alien, put him in B tier. On the flip side, we have Axel, the founder of the Rokar. His backstory is often told, but it's still a good one. Axel used to be among the best of the Angara, but being tortured by the Ket turned him into an extremist who wants nothing but their annihilation. His trauma has also made him hateful of all people that aren't Angaran. My kind of guy, he sees that aliens are a threat. Donald, you would be the kind of alien he hates. And I look forward to taking Axel out during y'all's loyalty mission. What I like about Axel is you can't change his mind. His mindset is born of intense pain and suffering, and should he survive your final encounter with him, he'll say he likely won't get over his hatred of aliens anytime soon, but he might start trying. A well-written, broken character. It's a shame we'll never see what becomes of him, but we'll put him in B tier for his potential as a character. Now the leader of the Ket forces we fight in Andromeda, the Archon, is next. This might be the worst villain in the entire Mass Effect franchise. He is extremely basic. All he wants is to take over the world and assimilate the other species in Andromeda. The Archon has none of Saren's or the elusive man's complex motivations, and he isn't nearly as atmospheric as Sovereign. All the Archon can do is trash talk everyone in the Helios Cluster. He abandons exalting the people and settles for wiping everyone out. Mind you, the entire reason the Ket are doing this is that they can't procreate on their own. They need to exalt to survive. Yet the Archon forgot about that and just decided to kill everyone. Unlike Saren, the Archon doesn't fight you directly, he just sends a bunch of remnant after you. The Archon completely fails as a villain. It's never threatening, doesn't serve as a good parallel to Ryder, and he completely forgets his original goal at the end of it all. F minus, without a doubt. How about Sloane Kelly, the leader of the outcasts on Kadara? She's kind of a bland version of Arya from Omega. 
The one interesting thing about Sloan is she apparently served in the Skillian Blitz, which means she potentially worked alongside Commander Shepard. An interesting origin story, but Sloan isn't worth much consideration in the main story, so she goes in D tier. We're nearing the end here. The last NPC to cover is Reyes Vidal, a smuggler who settled on Kadara. I don't care much for this guy, but I had high hopes for him when he challenged Sloan to a one-on-one -on -one duel for leadership of the outcast, and then it turns out he was cheating. No honor among thieves, I guess, but after he did that, I was immediately against him. That's surprising, Donald. I took you for a dirty fighter. I'm familiar with being cheated out of an honest win, so I had to side with Sloan there. Stay mad, Donald. Anyway, put Vidal in F tier for being a dirty cheat. It's done, and our final character is none other than Ryder themselves. Anything to say, gentlemen? Ryder is interesting. Unlike Shepard, they are determined to get the job done, but they're unproven as a pathfinder, which is why certain authority figures refuse to give you the respect the title assumes. You can see the difference between Ryder and Shepard by seeing how the team treats them. In Mass Effect, every team meeting ends with Shepard dismissing everyone, but at the start of Andromeda, the team will dismiss themselves from the meeting. Regular citizens also don't show Ryder a lot of deference. Playing as Ryder, you're forming your own reputation instead of just adopting one as you do as Shepard. It arguably creates a closer connection with Ryder than with Shepard in the first Mass Effect game. When you start the trilogy, Shepard is already level 100, while Ryder is starting at level zero. It would have been wonderful to see how Ryder could have developed. They had the potential to become an iconic player character in gaming. And I think that's the crux of the issue with Andromeda. Due to its poor release, the game was understandably criticized and memed upon until BioWare and EA gave up on supporting it and has seemingly killed the series of games it was undoubtedly meant to have. I can't help but think of a reality where Andromeda comes out in a complete state and has proper developer support. Instead of waiting on a return to the Milky Way, we might all be playing Andromeda 2 right now. I don't like Andromeda that much. If I'm honest, I'll never play it repeatedly as I have done with the trilogy and I doubt I'll ever get fully engrossed in its lore. But part of me wishes it could have been that game. That's all there is to say about Andromeda, a game that came out and bombed due to development hell and being abandoned. This game stands as an example of why it's always better to delay something than to put out a broken product. Breaking the fourth wall here, but if you're going to play Andromeda, get it on sale. The creator got it for a mere $7.50, and for that I suppose it was worth it. But honestly, you're not missing much if you never play Andromeda. Wait, oh my god, the creator... Boys, are we real? Is this all just a simulation? Uh-oh, Joe, why don't we go have a little talk over here? Oh god, there is no talk. Nothing happens after these videos cut to black. We're just wild imaginings of some guy. Okay, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, and evening, viewers. Joe, calm down.